I want to also mention something, it will be not very long, on this other type of cell, which are solid oxide fuel cell, because this fuel cell, although apparently they have a problem because they operate at a very high temperature, but um, they are uh, under, um, under study now, so we will... Um, should say something about. Okay, <clears throat> let's see how a fuel cell, uh, uh, a solid oxide fuel cell work. The solid oxide fuel cell is called in this way because now the electrolyte, instead of being a membrane, as we have seen so far, is a ceramic where you have conduction by oxygen. And uh, we discussed uh, this ceramic last year, and we will uh, maybe say something <coughs> also this time. <coughs> I know how this works. We have um, in the <coughs> here, we will have hydrogen and CO. I will tell you why we are using this CO. We have also CO. And uh, this is the fuel. And uh, here we have the uh, oxidation of, uh, we have this reaction. Bless you. And uh, here instead we have some uh, oxygen conducting uh, electrolyte. So we have formation of O minus, O minus minus as a matter of fact, which goes through here and then <coughs> Uh, no, actually, sorry, we will have air coming here. Air is o uh, reduced, O2 is reduced to 2O minus minus, there is one minus missing here. The O minus minus go through here and then react with the, with the fuel. So at the cathode here, we have a reduction of oxygen with the formation of 2O2 2 minus. At the anode, you see this O minus come here. <coughs> and uh, react with hydrogen, <coughs> which go through the, the, <coughs> the permeable uh, uh, anode. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> and uh, we have this type of uh, <coughs> reaction, formation of water, or since we have also CO, this other reaction. In total, is the one is the typical reaction of fuel cell, formation of water, and the other one instead is formation of CO2. This, as we will see, this battery operates around 900 degrees. So all these materials now have to be completely different than the one so far discussed. Why this cell, which operates at very high temperature, has some interest? For two reasons. First, being operated at this temperature, as I said before, we could have the, the in situ uh, reforming of methane with the formation then of CO. This is why we have CO. And secondly, since we operate at 90 degrees, we can get rid of platinum as a catalyst. We can use some nickel compound. Much cheaper, right? In fact, the cell components are, at the cathode, we have uh, <coughs> uh, as a catalyst, not necessary anymore platinum, but we can use perovskite oxide, such, such as lantern or manganese oxide, with some substitute. Cheap material. The anode also, we can replace the platinum with this nickel, a combination of nickel with electrolyte. YSZ stays for yttria stabilized zirconia, which is the electrolyte. We'll see that soon. And in fact, the electrolyte is this zirconia oxide, which is uh, <coughs> stabilized by yttria. We have to prepare this uh, fuel cell in stacks. Stacks means that we have to stack one cell on top of the other. And to stack one cell on top, on top of the other, we have to connect the cell. Like if you want to stack two pieces of, of wood, one on, on top of the other, you have to put some uh, 
come si dice? How do you say? Collant between the two. Okay? And uh, in this particular case, the choice of the material is not so easy because we have to operate at a thousand degrees. So we must uh, select material which can stand at high temperature. So, in so interconnection is uh, mostly use this uh, metallic alloy like ferriti stainless steel or lanthanum chromite. Operation temperature around 19 degrees. So you, you see here a very schematic way how we have uh, <coughs> the electrolyte operates and uh, <coughs> the, pla uh, the, the, and the nickel. <coughs> so this is the electrolyte, see, which is uh, the yttria stabilized zirconia. This is an oxide, which has some va oxygen vacancies and the ocean can jump from vacancy to the other and then conduct the current. This instead is the nickel plus mix with this electrolyte and it's, this is a good conductor. So you see now we have that here, oxygen arrive at these points and uh, <coughs> at these points you have the reaction. Remember that in a, in a fuel cell you must have a three-phase three contact, electrolyte, electrons and species, gas. Now why we have to operate this cell at 1000 degrees? This is because if we look at the conductivity of the electrolyte, and forget about this one because uh, I don't want to confuse you, but look at this black one which is the typical electrolyte. This is the Arrhenius plot. Remember that the Arrhenius plot report the conductivity actually log of conductivity versus temperature. But this, here we have a reciprocal uh, absolute temperature, here we have the, the temperature in, 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 <coughs> in Celsius. And you see that uh, the, uh, the useful conductivity to allow a fuel cell to operate is in this area. And uh, <coughs> this uh, Electrolyte reaches this conductivity only around 1,000 degrees. Also, you see that uh, this line, as also these ones, is very steep. So this indicates that um, the activation energy is very low. <coughs> so activation energy is very low. This, this means that we have some difficulties in ionic transport. And these difficulties also uh, explains why we had to operate at 1,000 degrees. I told you that uh, due to the uh, <coughs> high operation uh, <coughs> temperature, we can have a reformer within the, 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 the fuel cell. So you see that here is the fuel cell stuck. That means uh, two or three more unit connected and uh, <coughs> you see that here you can start uh, with uh, diesel, kerosene, gasoline, whatever you like. Then of course you have to, to purify this uh, gas, eliminate sulfur, which is very bad for the cat catalyst, and then the gas is reformed reform and goes directly into the cell. Of course you need some other uh, <coughs> I mean, this reform is, is rather complicated and big because, uh, the, of course, the reformer needs some, also some water and you need some uh, heat. So you have to, to pro provide that, but the heat can come directly from the cell. So it's, uh, really this is uh, very convenient. Or you can have all this part here outside the fuel cell. Okay? Suppose that, for instance, you're using the fuel cell for a, for a, a building. Then the fuel cell is there, and outside is the reformer. And this is more flexible because if it is outside, you can use different temperature, right, of course. So the, this fuel cell operates at 900 degrees. So all this has also to operate at 900 degrees if we are using internal reformer. But if you go outside, we can change the conditions. This can be useful sometimes. <coughs> 
Uh, for this fuel cell, we have two configurations. One is called tubular. Okay, so you see here that in this tubular configuration, you have uh, uh, the uh, electrolyte is the yellow one. Uh, the uh, cathode is the this one, the red one, and the air electrode is green one. So the, is a, remember that uh, the cathode is uh, <coughs> this cermet, uh, uh, nickel cermet. So you can make this uh, nickel cermet, which is a ceramic, in the form of tube. Then the electrolyte is a ceramic because it's zirconium oxide. So you make a ceramic on top of that. And then the other one is lanthanum, manganese. So it's also a, a, a ceramic. And then you can connect this unit with another unit by using this interconnection. Or you can have a, 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 a planar, planar configuration where you have more or less the same thing, but this, instead of being tubular, they are planar. I think here is easier. It's clear. So you, you see here, we have uh, the anode, which is uh, <coughs> where the fuel is coming, which is, can be uh, this reformer, reforming hydrogen. And uh, then you have uh, the cathode. I'm sorry, no. This is the anode is here. This the electrolyte is the cathode. Then you have the interconnection and then another system. Of course, you must have uh, some type of uh, porous system to let uh, the, the air going down. So uh, maybe I have to repeat that because I, say, I, I, I didn't say correctly. So this is the anode, this is the electrolyte, this is the cathode. And this is one fuel cell unit. Then you can start with another unit. You, uh, you see only the anode here, but it will be electrolyte and cathode. And these units are interconnected. Okay. And this interconnection, apart, to, apart from standing a very high temperature, it must also allow gas to go through. It, is a it, it seems a complicated structure, but it's not that complicated. The only problem here is to select material which can stand very high temperature. And here you see some uh, curve. This is the typical current voltage. It's not bad. We have about uh, 800 millivolts and about uh, between 500 and 600, uh, 600 uh, milliampere hours square centimeter and some decent uh, <coughs> uh, power. Of course, as we increase the temperature, we have better performance. Why? Because, the, of course, the conductivity of the electrolyte increases. So let's see what are the, the, the application. I save you all this because we already discussed that. So obviously, we can use uh, solid oxide fuel cell only for a cost and load application, not on mobile. And I have here some examples. This, for it, oops, this is the last slide. You see here, we had one, one kilowatt residential house power unit. So maybe if you have uh, <coughs> your country house, maybe some of you has a country house. Do you have a country house? <coughs> Do you have a country house? A house in the countryside? No. Your parents? No. Okay. If, suppose they have it. There is no electricity there. So they can buy a fuel cell unit to, to have lights, cooking, and so forth. Okay? It's a bit expensive, but you. This is very, it's a very big one, about 100 kilowatt hour unit. So this this may maybe <coughs> provide energy for a, an, apar a, an apartment store or many apartments. 